And uh, today is Epiphany. How many of you know what Epiphany is? How many of you know what an Epiphany is? What's an Epiphany? A revelation. Thank you. And so today on the traditional church calendar is Epiphany, and it means revelation. And it talks about two things. Usually uh, in the traditional church, you preach one of two subjects this morning. You preach the Magi. Or you preach the baptism of Jesus, where the Father and the Spirit revealed the Son. And so this morning, we're going to do the Magi. Somebody asked me all about that, and so I said, sure, we can do that. So uh, we're into Epiphany, so turn in your Bible, would you please, to Matthew's Gospel. It's Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2. Matthew's Gospel, the second chapter. We're only going to do the first part. The second part gets a little messy, and it takes a little bit of talking. And so we'll not get there this morning, not that this won't, but uh, we'll get there. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2. We're going to look at the first 12 or 14 verses, 12 verses I think will do just fine. 1 to, 1 to 12 will do. So let's do that together, all right? Are you ready? Notice, notice what you're reading now, because this is it. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, During the time of Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. And they asked, where is the one who is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. And so he called together all of the religious leaders and said to them, the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, and he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for that is what the prophet has written. But you, uh, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, go and make careful search for the child, and as soon as you find him, report to me that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, the Bible says, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And then having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Is the story the way you remember it? Ah, good. Yeah, okay, now you can tell how old I am. The first Star Trek. And I mean, you thought it was a movie. But this is the first one this morning. Now, in all the traditional nativity scenes, like this one over here, always you see these guys all dressed up in a camel. How many of you have one of these at home? How many of you know we've all believed a lie? All right. You say, why do you keep that thing? Can I tell you why we keep that thing? Let me be honest with you. There's a young lady in our community who is handicapped. She's now, she's got to be in her 30s now. And her name is Caitlin. And for her, in her childhood, that was always out at this church. And she knows what the time of year is. She comes in on a Sunday morning and she sits down on the floor in front of that thing and just remembers the story. And so I didn't put that thing up for you. I put it up for her. Why? What did you learn last week? People matter. People matter. 
But if you have read that text, as you should have with me this morning, you know the first thing was that they were no longer in a stable if they were in one to start with. Because the Bible says that they came to the house. And he also uses the word child instead of infant in the thing. And so we know from what the Magi told Herod, if you go to slide your finger down, we didn't read to verse 16. But the Magi told Herod that the star rose two years before. So this is no more infant, lowly, infant, holy. This is a lad now who is likely about 12 to 24 months old when the Magi finally show up. And the, so the people we traditionally referred to as the, as the wise men in the Greek language and Hebrew as well as Magi, it's the word we derive our word magician from. So who are these guys? Who are these magi that came to see Jesus? Well, strangely enough, they don't look like anything you've ever seen. Those are the magi. We try when we do uh, these things in the 21st century to make sure that there's someone of every race represented. There was no such animal. The magi are from... Parthia. The Parthian Empire was running contrary to the Roman Empire at this time, and there was a constant battleground that they had. And the battleground actually was always over this soft territory in the middle called the Middle East. And one of the priceless little treasures in the middle of it was a little strip of land that the Roman government called the province of Judea. And so we have these characters called magi. They were Persian kingmakers. Because they were aware of the birth of the anticipated king, they had heard about it. How did they hear? Well, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but I'll give you a clue. His name was Daniel. Oh, and the other guy that they know is a, ch a chap by the name of Balaam. Have you ever heard of Balaam? Now, history tells us, and it's a little bit shaky, but that Balaam was likely one of the very first in this elect little group. And so you need to know that these guys have a great deal of history. Now Daniel, Daniel chapter 4 verse 9 was appointed the master of the Magi. You need to know that. By Nebuchadnezzar and his sons when he was ruling the Babylonian Empire. And Daniel is so good at what he does in this Magi role that he will survive a transition. When the Babylonian uh, 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 empire collapses and the Medo-Persian empire, did you hear the word Persian? Yeah, you better. The Persian empire rises. They keep Daniel and he becomes a friend of Cyrus who sends Ezra and some people back to build the temple and he is also a friend of a guy by the name of Darius whom you know from the book of Nehemiah. So you need to see that shadowy figure named Daniel in the background. In all of these things. And from others of the Israelites who when captured became part of that select group in Babylon. Now by the time we get to the first century, these magi are still a tremendous power in the east. Their wisdom and skills have allowed them to endure through at least four empires by this time. Some of them used their power, position, and skills with a great amount of wisdom. Others, well, they just turned into bad people. 
like any influential scientist or religious leader or high-ranking politician or any other well-decorated, skilled person of any day, we can apply our craft deceitfully or we can apply it honestly. And some of these men were honest men, and they elevated their craft of wisdom and political advice, maintaining their place of honor among rulers and peoples. God had said in Luke's gospel that he would do signs in the heavens, and he did act, and these ancient stargazers were some of the ones who caught it. Like Daniel before them, they studied the great books of wisdom from the Old Testament, the wisdom of below, but often they were also looking at the heavens up above. And while there was a corrupt crew of them that traveled around. You'll meet these folks periodically in the New Testament. There's two that you know of. Do you know who they are? One of them's name is Simon. He's called Simon the Magician, if you've got a a modern translation in the book of Acts. His name is actually Simon the Magi. The other one Paul runs into, and his name is Elimaeus the Magi, who we call Elimaeus the Sorcerer. And so there were good, and there were bad. Now at the birth of Jesus, there's a battle going on, the Parthian Empire to the right in the east, and the Roman Empire in the west. And the buffer zone that bounced back and forth is colored there for you. And you can see Israel is in that darkened area. And so they had been influencing politics in Judea for a long time. Parthia was ruled by a council called the Megastenes, and that's not on the test. You don't have to worry about it. But anyways, it's not going to be on the quiz. But the ruling body controlled the Parthian Persian Empire at this time. It was totally composed of magi whose duty it was to select a king, and they had picked a dud. His name was Phrates IV. And just about this time, history tells us, they ditched him. And so the Magi are looking for another king. And they're watching the horizon to see what is going on now. No doubt those who made the trek were devout men believing in the true God of creation under the influence of that guy called Daniel. They had read the true, about the true God of creation and the promises in his word. They were also familiar with the original signs and symbols that God had imposed on the stars. From the earliest times, men and women have perverted the regular movements of heavenly bodies into astrology, and millions will consult their readings every day. Can I tell you, if you're doing that, first word, stop. Why? Well, because even Job knows this. Oh, Job, let me read to you from Job. How come Job isn't there? Job should be there helping me. Uh, Well, that is Job, actually. That's not, it says Jeremiah, don't believe a word that's written on that paper. That is from the book of Job, friends. It is Job chapter 9, and here's what it says. He who commands, and Job is talking about God here, the sun, and it does not shine, and seals up the stars. What's he sealing up? He's sealing up any information that you can glean from them. Why? Because there's information to glean. He alone spreads out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. He makes the bear and Orion and the Pleiades and the constellations of the southern sky. He does great and unsearchable things, wonderful things without number. When does Job live? Job lives somewhere between Abraham and Jacob. Long before there was such a thing as astrology or astronomy, they had all this stuff lined up. And they had figured out that God had sealed up the stars. In fact, so much so that when Jeremiah does come along a few generations later and there is trouble because people think they can do this stuff, he says, do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs in the heavens. They're looking at the stars and trying to tell you what's going on. 
for the Gentiles are dismayed at them. Don't worry about it. He said, unless I tell you, you have no idea what's going on up there. That's not how you guide your life. God's word to you. But occasionally, God lets humanity in on his attention, intentions rather through signs in the heavens. And as we shall see, it comes through God's own prophetic telling that the Magi are able to recognize this new star that blazes forth. And when they meet Herod, they call it his star. Did you see that in your text? They not only know the star, they know who it is there for. How do they know these things? Ah, we shall get there. As we shall see, the prophet Daniel established the timing of the great king's coming. And the appearance of the star was going to serve to confirm it. And apparently the magi were so elated that they decided to make the long pilgrimage from Parthia to Jerusalem to find and worship him. So in 6 or 5 BC, this couldn't be an overnight arrangement. Considerable time was required to assemble the entourage, and so that's what they did. And they headed off towards Judea in the province under Roman control at that time where Jesus was born. Now, Matthew includes this particular part of Jesus' story because Matthew's purpose in writing his gospel is to show Jesus as the Messiah King that God promised. And while Israel, he came unto his own, and his own, John said, received him not. So Matthew says, although they can't tell who he is, everybody on the outside can figure it out. And so these Gentile kingmakers show up and recognize and honor the king, the child of Mary, and support Matthew's purpose of showing us these things. In chapter 1, he tells us through the birth, through the birth log that he's got there of all the ancestry of Jesus, that Jesus belongs to the line of David and he stands in it and he rightfully can sit on this throne. In the second chapter, he shows the recognition that was due him had come to him. So these magi are on the first star, first star Trek. Let's pull some things out as we wander by, shall we? I'll give you lots of stuff to play with this morning. Don't worry. It's the first Star Trek. And a successful search for God always leads to Jesus. A successful search for God always leads to Jesus. Now when we talk about the magi, the first thing we assume is that there were three of them. How many were there? Did you read it in the text? How many magi were there? Well, we don't know. All we know is that there were three. Yeah. That's all we know. So if you're playing Bible trivia and somebody asks, how many magi, what's the answer? I don't know. Good answer. Good answer. Because we don't have any idea. As we noted in our description, these influential men came searching for a king. Interestingly, the Jewish people, or at least their leaders, the teachers of the law and the like, who should have been in the loop and were theoretically looking for the promised Messiah, were not looking as hard as they should, or they had already decided how this was going to happen. I love Bible charts and all those things that tell me what's going to happen when Jesus comes. Just remember this. Go with the book, not the chart. Because the Sadducees and the Pharisees had made their own chart and decided what the Messiah was going to look like when he came and where he would come from and how it would be all together. So when this guy shows up at this time, that no, nah, this isn't it. In fact, you'll watch Jesus' disciples all through the Gospels. Periodically, Jesus makes a statement, and one of them pulls him aside like Peter and says, Nay, Lord, it cannot be so. Well, how does he know? Well, it's not in the chart. It's not in the map that we were given by the Pharisees to tell us how this was all going to come together. 
Jesus rebukes him. Peter! Well, he doesn't say that. It was real, a little nastier than that. It had a bit of an edge. Get thee behind me, Satan, I think was the all exact statement that day. He said, you're going after the things of men. Oh, wait a minute. Not the things of God. I love the charts. But be careful with those things, would you? Because the religious leaders are going to miss out when he shows up. Even though sometime before, they must have heard this crazy testimony about angels from a bunch of shepherds on the night of his birth. They must have heard about the ecstatic and prophetic words from Simeon and Anna at his dedication in the temple 40 days later. But they were too sold on their own agenda, too preoccupied with their own idea of how the Messiah would appear to be concerned about this announcement about the arrival of the Messiah. This is just another one of those stories. So be sure. So sure of their inter interpretation of the Old Testament Scriptures were they that they troubled themselves not to go to Bethlehem and see what had come to pass. So two years after the star first appears, these powerful influencers from a distant land come seeking him. These Gentiles who are significant people in the culture of the time came from afar to seek out and acknowledge the coming of a king. So Jesus is king. This account then serves as a reinforcement of the kingliness of Christ and his right to reign, not only in the world, but in your life and mine. The confession of the early church is this, Jesus is Lord. Because there was only one Lord, and his name was Jesus. So, on that particular evening that we read about today, the common people, the rulers and the leaders, the theologians and priests of Israel are totally indifferent. Or like Herod, they're filled with bitterness, hatred and envy and jealousy and wanted any threat to the status quo dealt with. And he will deal with it. If you read on, you'll see how he decided to do that. So right here at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, we see the way life is going to be after Jesus. There's going to be people who are indifferent. There are going to be those like Herod who are antagonistic. And there are going to be those people who seek out the king to worship him. So when the Magi arrive in Jerusalem and begin to question the people in the capital, here's the question they ask, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Now Herod immediately grasps what was going on and he starts to get panicky. Let me give you two reasons for that. First, you have to know that when these Persian kingmakers appeared in Jews Jerusalem, they would have been traveling in an entourage. When anyone of any significance in this country travels, they do not travel alone. In fact, we were zooming up to QEW uh, a year or two ago, and all of a sudden, there's like eight black, giant Cadillac SUVs flying up the road all together in tandem. And we knew that somebody had come to Canada. In one of those SUVs was somebody who was somebody because those black SUVs all together with their little lights and all the guys with the little headsets that you can barely see through the tinted glass. And so you have to know that when the Magi, who are the kingmakers of the East, show up anywhere, they travel with a huge entourage. And well, these are men of wealth and power. They don't travel alone. The Persian cavalry, historians tell us, would have traveled with them for their safety. And when they came riding into the city of Jerusalem and Herod peeked out his palace window, he flipped. 
He immediately recognized these powerful men by their garb and the entourage that was with them. How did he know them? Well, history tells us that Herod used to fight himself. In fact, he had been engaged, the Bible says, uh, not the Bible says, history tells us, as a Roman soldier with the Persians in one of their incursions into this land. And they had not done well that day. So when these gentlemen come riding into town, Herod, the Bible says, was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. Why? Well, Herod's title was king of the Jews, but he wasn't a Jew. He was an Idumean. In other words, he was of the children of Esau. He wasn't even Jewish. He got the job because his father was the proconsul of Israel before him. And he had told Julius Caesar that his boy would make a great king in the region. And the proconsul influenced Julius, I mean Caesar, Augustus rather, and Augustus had appointed him to the job. So when Herod hears, he is really upset. Why is he so upset? Because this is the one who is born king. He didn't buy the job. He's not going to get the job just because. You have to know that the Parthians have also interfered in Jewish history before. In fact, Herod got the job, but the Parthian Empire and the Magi were pushing a man by the name of John Hyrcanus to take the job. And they had been influencing the region. Herod had won out because of his father's influence. So Caesar Augustus crowned him king? Well... Here's the problem that you need to know. Caesar Augustus is now an old man. He's hanging by a thread. Herod himself is no young chicken. If if history is true and we believe that it is, he's going to die in the next couple of years. He is not young either. Tiberius was the the, uh, Roman chief of the guard and was over the Roman... Uh, what do they call him? Chief of Staff? What the, what's a top military dog called? G- not general. But anyways, yeah. It was a, yeah, some kind of title for him. Anyways, I'll, I'll find it in the notes somewhere after we're done. Tiberius was there, and he was the head of the Roman army, and he had just retired. So Herod knows he's hanging by a thread. Caesar's about to die. They don't have any military leadership at this point. What a great day to mount an attack, and here come the Parthians. And so Herod is not only shaken in his boots, all Jerusalem with him is uneasy. Why? Because they know they live in the buffer zone. So the Magi and their entourage from the east appear and they tell him that they've been following this strange star. Now, I just used two words that don't go together in the text that you read. Did you notice that? I said they followed the star. Did they follow the star? No, they didn't. Pardon me? No, they knew where to go. Why? Because it was his star. You say, how do they know that? Oh, give me a minute. I'll get you there. They saw the star when it rose. And they knew where to go. How did they know? How did they know all these things? Well, one of their early leaders, if history holds true, was Balaam, the son of Baor. And you have his words recorded back in the book of Numbers. Before Israel had even taken the land the first time. Go there with me. It's the book of Numbers, chapter 24. Here's what it says. Balaam is in a prophetic moment. He's having a a, a season where he's getting revealed to him from God about the future. And what does he see? I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near a star. Oh, there it is. 
will come out of Jacob and a scepter will rise out of Israel. It will crush the forehead of Moab, break down all the sons of Sheth, Edom. What is Herod? He's an Edomite. Oh boy, no wonder he's peeing himself. Edom shall be dispossessed. Seir also, his enemies, shall be dispossessed. Israel is doing valiantly. And one from Jacob shall exercise dominion. A star would come. How the star came or what it is, we're really not totally sure. But in Matthew chapter 2, 2, that's what they told us. We saw his star when it rose. We know who he is. We know our history. Do you know yours? Herod said, nope. And I'm convinced that they had read these things and taken hold of the pieces. Why? Because Daniel is not an unintelligent man. And in Daniel chapter 7, he sees something. Are you ready? Here's Daniel's revelation moment. And I continued watching in the night visions, and I saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he approached the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. Number verse 14, he was given authority to rule and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, look at this, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be. They were looking for his star. They were looking for this guy. How did they know that this was this? Oh, because that's not all Daniel wrote. Trust me. Daniel chapter 9, some of you study prophetic things in the weeks of Daniel. Well, let's have a look at those just for half a second, shall we? This is not a prophetic uh, seminar. No one understand this. God says to Daniel, from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, there will be seven weeks of sevens and 62 weeks of sevens. Each week has seven days. Each day represents a year. The announcement to rebuild Jerusalem came at the time of Darius through a guy by the name of Nehemiah. He read the edict. These guys are running the show at the time. They know when the decree was signed. They know that 67 weeks times 7 and 62 weeks times 7 is 483 years. They know what time it is. Hello? They not only they know it's his star because Daniel told them how long it would be till this guy showed. They told him he would show up and there would be a star. It would be his star. And it would be 483 years from the edict. Interesting to me that the tools for discerning the approximate time of the Messiah's first coming was given to the people of God and they were unaware. But apparently... The people on the outside figured it out. The only thing they didn't have was access to the book of Micah. How do I know? Because they came to Jerusalem. And Micah told them where he was going to be born. But they came to Jerusalem to the capital and says, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Well, naturally, he should be born in the capital city, wouldn't you think? And Herod consults with the Jewish leaders, and they tell him, no, 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 no. He's going to get born down in Bethlehem. Born in Bethlehem. Where is the one born king? That's the question then. And for 2,000 years, it's always been the same question. Where is the one God promised? That's what everybody wants to know. There's a young man on last Sunday morning committed his life to Christ at the close of the service said to me, the answer's 
I got the answers. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I've been following three religions. I've been serving and looking at and studying three religions. And this morning, I got the answers. He said, what do I got to do now? I said, pray. He said, done. I said, well, you got to get baptized. He said, okay. When do we get started? The question is always the same. Where's the one God promised? Well, let me tell you where is the one that God promised. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, if this screen will cooperate with me, says that we must focus on Jesus, the source and goal of our faith. He saw the joy ahead of him, endured the death on the cross, ignored the disgrace that brought him, and received the highest position in heaven. Where is Jesus? Seated at the right hand of the throne of God, the place of power, authority, and influence. Romans chapter 8, 34 picks that up. Well, who then will condemn us if we are followers of Jesus? No one for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting at the place of honor at God's right hand doing what? interceding for us. Every time you screw up, every time you mess up, he is there at Father's right hand. No, 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 he's one of ours. No, she's one of ours. Lord, we got to work this thing out. You and I, we got to figure out how to, how to work with them on this. He stands ever interceding to the Father for his children. Now, if you seek God and ask him to reveal himself to you, you will always end your search with Jesus. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. That's it. You go any place else and get any other answer, and you've been lied to. If they tell you, well, you got to go through, well, you need to talk to, nah, -uh. one God, one mediator, and there's his name. If you want to know where Jesus is, he's at Father's right hand. He's working on your behalf right now. He gave himself as a ransom for all, which is a testimony, the Bible says, given at the appropriate time. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in the Son and through him to do what? To reconcile all things to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross. He is going to reconcile you back into the family of God if you will choose to come. Through the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Through him, everything happens. Whether things on earth or things in heaven. The Magi I know. Do you know? The Magi I know. That a successful search for God leads to Jesus. And if you're wise... You'll do what they did and bow before Jesus and offer him your best. They bowed themselves, the Bible said, before him, this one or two year old lad, and they are flat out on the floor, face down, giving honor to him. But that's not all. You see, worship implies submission. When you give your worship to one, you honor him as Lord, who is your Lord this morning. Why call you me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I tell you, Jesus said. Are you down there on the floor worshiping him, or are you figuring this all out yourself? In fact, Paul says, here's what you got to do. They fell down and they worshiped him. That's what they did. Okay, here we go. Go, go. With eyes wide open to the mercies of God, Paul says, I beg you, brothers and sisters, an act of intelligent worship 
Give him your body. Give him your life as a living sacrifice, sacrifice consecrated to the him, acceptable, acceptable by him. Do not let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you can prove in practice that the plan of God for you is good, meets all his demand, and moves you towards the goal of true maturity. If you're wise, you'll bow before him and offer him your very best. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. I do this because Jesus is my Lord, and I give thanks to God the Father. Through him, he is the way to God. Yeah. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, you better be able to do it to the glory of God or you should not engage. Worship him. Worship is not just a song, although singing is part of it. But here's what the Bible says. If we died with Christ, we believe that we will live with him. We have a future. Did you see that? We know that since Christ has been raised from the dead, he is never going to die again. He's telling you something about you, friends, if you have died with Christ. He is never going to die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. The life he lives, he lives to God. Paul said, so you too should consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so you obey its desires. Do not present the members of your body to sin as instruments to be used for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead and your members to God as instruments to be used for righteousness. For sin will have no mastery over you. Why? Jesus is Lord. You say, well, I have this little problem and I can't seem to... Whoa, 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 whoa. Last line, for sin will have no what? It will not control you. You have the power in Christ to control it. Whoa. You see, you worship. You bow in submission before the Lord. And every day, you and I offer him all that we have and are, recognizing that he has given us eternal life, forgiven us our sin. And although my body someday will be in a box at the front of a church just like this one, and hopefully there will be people crying. Not that you know, thank God. The Bible says that when my body gives up, I walk right from this life into the next. And all that I am and truly am will slip from this life into the next. And at a date and time that God has decided that he has not told us about, he said, I'll put a brand new body, Jim Wright 2.0. Back together. He who lives and believes in me, Jesus said, will never die because I am Lord of all. Here's the other thing that I know, just as we're wrapping it all up this morning, that after you worship Jesus, if you really worshiped him, you can't go home the same way that you came. And being warned in a dream, Matthew 2, verse 12 says, not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. After they bowed in worship, God warned the Magi in a dream that there's another way. Not only did they return by a different route, they went back different men. Because when you truly encounter Jesus as the Christ, recognizing who he is, you will never be the same. You will go home a different person. So let me ask you, will you go home a different person today? 
Once you meet Jesus, your life takes on a brand new direction. The Bible says this, if anyone is in Christ, he has become a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And God begins with your cooperation to reshape and renew and refresh your person and your personality and prepare you for a life that is to come. For the Bible says that we were buried with him in baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. We can have a brand new life. I am not the man that I was. Sin shall no longer have mastery over me. Do I screw up? Ask my kids. They will tell you it's true. But here's what I know. I'm not the man that I was, and I'm not the man I'm going to be because Jesus Christ is Lord, and his Holy Spirit is in me, and he's working with me every single day, and he's shaping and molding, renewing and refreshing, and someday I'm going to step out of this body into his presence, and by the grace of Almighty God, he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Welcome home. Isn't that what you want? Yeah. Can I show you where this Star Trek goes? Let me show you. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth. That's the one you're stepping on. Had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. There it is. Prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Watch this now. And then he will wipe away. Did you see that? Every tear from their eyes. There will be no more deaths or mourning, or crying, or pain, because the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. He's making you today a new creation to fit in to the new creation that he is making. He's setting you up for a future. Sure, you don't fit in here. Sure, stuff doesn't align in this life. Why? Because you are being set up for a place that you haven't even seen yet. But because God is God and Jesus is Lord, they will prep you for the place you've never been. A number of years ago, Mick and I traveled to the Ukraine. We had never been there before. And uh, we needed a little help, to say the very least, to get organized to know what to do and what not to do, what to bring, what not to bring, how to prepare for a place we'd never been, to walk among a people that we had never walked among, to say the words of Jesus in a way that could be understood It took a little education. Your brother did it. Ron Garrison and his wife. And God in this moment is preparing you for a place you've never been. How do you prepare someone for a job that they've never had in a place they've never been? You call it trust. Will you trust him with your 2024 stretching out in front of you? They saw the star and they knew it was time. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Stars have always fascinated us. 
Starlight, star bright, the first star I see tonight. I wish I may, I wish I might. Have the wish I wish tonight. Have you seen the star? Are you still searching like the Magi? You may call it ultimate truth or whatever you'd like. Circling for purpose or meaning or happiness or peace. You may not even know exactly what it is you're looking for. You just know there must be more than this. And I tell you that in 2021... Six people sat down and chatted with you and me and said, I would follow Jesus. Some of them are sitting in this room. The last one came to me last Sunday morning at the close of the service. Something's starting to happen in this town. It's not just in this town, it's in this region. My daughter goes to a church, a little church up the road called Lake Mountain. Matt Tapley told his congregation last Sunday morning as he wrapped up the year, he said that I got told, he said, in October that every Sunday I was to give an altar call because that is not my custom. You know that, he said. He said, can I tell you that from Thanksgiving until this Sunday, 200 people have come to Christ on Sunday mornings. Friends, it's not just happening here. God is doing something. Are you ready for 2024? Are you ready for all that he has for you? You see, wise men still seek him. Can I give you one last word from Daniel and then we pray? You get you ready for this? And those who are wise. Oh, that's what Daniel said. Hey, head of the Magi, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness, like the stars forever. Are you ready to get your shine on? Let's pray. God, we are so grateful for all that you have done. You guided men who did not know the way to a place that they had not been. You told them when, and you told them where, and you told them how. And Father, this congregation is going out into Niagara region this week. Some of them working, some of them walking, some of them in coffee shops and all over this community. Why? Because somebody needs to know. They need a light to shine so that they can see their way. To find their way to you. Find their way home. And so, Father, I pray for each one that is in this room today. That as we walk and as we work, that your Holy Spirit would come on us afresh. As you promised he would. You said your mercies were new every morning. And so today we receive your mercy for this day and tomorrow again. And we anticipate a future that is different than the one that we are living in. And we make way for the king. Way for his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray that you will use us. And if there's one this morning who has joined us, who has not yet made that choice to follow you, may they see in us the joy, the transformation, and hear the testimony of our lives because you are changing us into the people you always dreamed we could be, preparing us for a place that you are preparing. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done and all you're going to do. And all God's people said... <laughs>